Welcome to DSEI Insights in Action. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Kevin Turney, Chief Security Officer from General Motors, and Karen Evans, Managing Director of Cyber Readiness Institute, to discuss a, a vital area of supply chain operations, third-party risk management. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Karen, for being with us. This is a timely uh, discussion because not only supply chain resilience, uh, top of the mind for global business leader, but also October is a cybersecurity awareness month when organizations in US, but as well around the world are focusing on educating the public and private sector on the importance of maintaining a good cybersecurity readiness practices. And uh, action CRI tackles all year long, and Karen will tell us more about it, focusing also on uh, providing tools to small and medium-sized businesses to make up the majority of participants in the global supply chain. Having an understanding and knowing that global organizations have their internal teams, but also caring about those small and medium-sized enterprises who don't, CRI is their partner in going forward. Kevin, in addition to this, uh, to his role at GM, is a member of the RSA, Conference Executive Security Action Forums, an organization of Fortune 1000 Chief Information Security Officers that has been helping companies to improve cyber risk management for the past 20 years. Now, last month, ESAF published a report on the state of the third-party risk management, how to how top CISOs are transforming third-party risk management. That report cites a survey of 100 CISOs of Fortune 1000 companies in the second quarter of this year that found 87% of the companies were affected by a significant cyber incident at a third party in the past 12 months. So this number is an alarming number, but what is important is what actions are actually taken to mitigate this. So thank you both for joining us for what really uh, seems to be a promising discussion uh, with the insights which can be actionable to all people who are interested in the topic. So let's start. Uh, maybe as we always do with a bold statement and you know, knowing what the report has uh, uh, shown, we can start that with the notion that the traditional cybersecurity approach are ineffective today. So how do we find ourselves in this situation that traditional approach to risk management is no longer effective? Kevin, can you please start? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, good morning, everyone. So, you know, I, I think this is a great report that ESOF, um, you know, just published just recently because it really pulls together a conversation that's been happening with, with top security leaders for several years. Uh, and if you go back, you know, several years, you think about how have security programs evolved across companies. Uh, it really started out focused on the company and the IT systems itself. It wasn't as much focus on the third party business partners and other ancillary parts of the business. And so, a lot of the, the resources and the, the, the primary uh, kind of efforts of the program were around protecting your own company's infrastructure. Well, I think the you know, big companies like General Motors and others, um, you know, along that, that sort of scale, I think we've, we've made the right investments over you know, many years to get to an okay spot. I mean, we're never perfect in security, as you know, but I feel like we're in a, a, a relatively uh, good spot. And I think the hackers have realized that as well. And they've realized that hey, going after the big, Fortune 100 type companies isn't netting the results that they, you know, that they once had. <clears throat> and so they've, they've turned their targets on smaller and medium sized companies, uh, which are largely a lot of the companies that we depend on for supply chain activity, whether it's parts or other services that go to our vehicles. It's generally these small and medium sized businesses that are now taking on the brunt of, of the, a lot of the cyber activity. And at the same time, you know, these are very cost pressured organizations. They don't have all the resources that a large company has. And so it's a, a bit of a perfect storm that we're seeing where these companies are, are really facing the front lines of a lot of these attacks. And so, you know, when I say uh, the traditional measures aren't really working, um, really what we created was a contractual sort of um, obligation on behalf of, you know, 
all of our companies that do business with us to do the right thing for security. And, you know, what we're seeing is that's really not having enough effect uh, because these companies are continuing to face issues. They're continuing to have cyber attacks. And so where we were, we're doing risk assessment, we were doing questionnaires, we were working with, with vendors and, and third parties. There's a whole host of new things that are coming out that try to assess the security score of, of a company. And what we've seen is that it's, it's not moving the needle and, you know, we're seeing more and more attacks. It's not going down. It's, it's going up in a lot of cases. And so, that's given us pause to step back and reflect and say, hey, there's there's got to be a different way. Um, brute forcing this all independently as separate companies, you know, isn't probably the most efficient path either. So what what's what's working out there? You know, let's find a new way. Let's let's try to understand, you know, collectively uh, how we can all get better together. So I'd say that's kind of how we got to where we are today. And, you know, I think that's why this sort of conversation and this sort of report is, is so timely. Thank you very much, Kevin. Just uh, trying to extend what we have started with this question, Karen, I think the view from CRI in a sense of, you know, is the alarm bell uh, for small and medium sized enterprises going inside their, you know, like uh, small organizations or no? I think it's it's very interesting to hear that side of the story. Uh, and um, first of all, thank you so much. And and I always like it, listening to Kevin speak because it always makes me think a little bit about what CRI is doing and kind of flipping it in the opposite direction. And that's probably primarily, Marco, one of the reasons why I joined CRI. I have held large positions, policy positions, operational positions for uh, close to 25 years managing large enterprises within the federal government that depend on private industry, but also recognize that it's small businesses. And when I was working on all that, I saw what we were pushing wasn't working. We drove a lot of the policies that people are implementing. We, you know, we developed in this framework, we developed in this standards, a lot of those things, uh, the intentions are great. The implementation is, is really hard. And so the outcome that everybody wants to achieve is the right outcome, but things get lost in the details of implementation. So to answer your question, are the alarm bells going off in small and medium businesses? I think Kevin hit it by saying they they are resource constrained. So when they're looking at these things, they they look at the problem differently. I want to be a good trading partner to GM, but I'm not necessarily thinking about all the outside risks associated with the technology I'm using. I'm thinking about GM has requirements on me, and I want to be that good trading partner in that supply chain. What I think Kevin also has highlighted is a lot of our adversaries or hackers or whatever we want to call them, they... They look at the large companies and then small companies become targets of opportunity in order to be able to fund their long-term plan that they have against a larger company or our nation as a whole here in the United States or any nation that a small business is doing um, you know, in a supply chain with a large company. And so it's a really complex landscape when they're very focused on, I want to grow my business. So that's a long answer to the question because but it's really building off of Kevin's point about the resource constraints of small and medium businesses. Thank you very much Karen and I I think you uh, let's say you linked things very well in a sense that on both ends on the spectrum of the let's say global enterprise and then on the spectrum of small medium sized businesses both parties are looking into how the, the synergies can work in order to improve the overall security. And this brings me also to the, to the next question. And, and Kevin, the report offers like seven new types of uh, approaches. So for setting priorities to verifying security controls to even providing security services. So can you discuss the new recommendations and uh, why they appear to be more successful at reducing risk? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I'll try not to make this a, a test. We'll see if I've you know, been able to memorize all these seven, seven priorities. But um, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, a lot of this really started out of contractual obligations. So uh, what the security team did in the past was they looked at what they were doing internally, wrote it down on a piece of paper, 
and talked to purchasing and said, hey, make sure that companies that we're contracting with are doing these same sort of things. Then that evolved into active questionnaires. Well, a lot of that's self-report, but you know, here answer all these sort of questions. And if we have issues, you know, we'll contact you and we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, and that's all evolved a little bit more into active auditing and you know, actually being on site in some circumstances. Uh, and then ultimately, <clears throat> now we're in a, a space where there's a lot of third party uh, companies who are doing assessments and doing scoring. And I, I mentioned some of that earlier. Um, but that's that's kind of the boundary though, of, of a kind of a standard third party security program today. What you see reflected in the report are really where do you go from there? And, and are those things truly effective? Are they really having the effect, which the hypothesis is no, because we're still having more and more uh, you know, cyber attacks in, in these sort of areas. And so if you go through and, you know, uh, a lot of this came from uh, active discussions that we've had as security leaders. So we've been in the room and we've said, hey, this isn't working. That's working. Um, hey, we're really frustrated with this whole thing. We feel like we're not making progress. I mean, there's been a lot of, I'd say, stewing over the problem. And I think that's why we really said, hey, this is a really good uh, topic to, to, to pull together, organize our thoughts, see what everyone's doing. And then that can hopefully serve as a, a, a kind of a mechanism for others to learn. And then ultimately, hopefully get to our end goal. I don't know that we're there yet, but I think this is definitely a, a great step. Um, so some of the key key aspects that are in the report, you know, first of all, you know, prioritizing the requirements. I mentioned earlier, a lot of times it's here's all the stuff. Here's the reams of requirements. Well, uh, as Karen, you know, indicated, these, these companies are resource constrained. So if I, as General Motors, give them a stack of 10,000 pages, it's not going to happen. So how do I help, a, you know, prioritize what are the most effective security controls that a company can implement? And then go deep on those. So instead of just saying, here's what we want you to do and walking away, having a little bit more deeper conversation, you know, getting evidence that those controls are being implemented appropriately, uh, having a bit more of a two-way dialogue. So building that that relationship becomes really important. Um, in addition to that, you know, looking looking at the problem more from a resiliency perspective. So instead of just saying, let's, you know, put everything against stopping this, let's also think about if it does happen, how do we recover fast? How do we, you know, eliminate the downtime, even if cyber uh, events are occurring? And I think that's a really important area. And it's one that the security team and other part cross-functional parts of the business really have to work together on and understand, you know, how do you keep the, the business as resilient as possible in the face of lots of different risks and, and, and threats out there, I, you know, whether it's a cyber attack or a tsunami or, you know, um, labor outages, there's all kinds of, of these sort of risks out there that we have to think about in terms of how you run the business. And so I think bringing cyber security issues up in that conversation and making sure that we are thinking about our supply chain or, you know, our supply base, how we're transporting goods, and you know how does how do we recover uh, very quickly in those sort of circumstances becomes you know very very important. Um, another piece of it is is help and resources, and I think CRI is a great partner in this, which is you know helping to bring education to these companies that are are resource constrained and giving them kind of a leg in the door. If here's information um, that people could be taking these courses and, and never thought about cybersecurity, and they're having to kind of come in on, on the ground level, I think it's extremely important. It's a resource that we leverage and. You know, we share with with our supply base, and I think it's it's programs like that, as well as maybe engaging in your your ISAC ISACs or information sharing analysis centers that are kind of organized by by sector. Um, you know, there's many resources in those if you can get engaged, and you know, just ourselves as as a, a OEM, you know, or original equipment manufacturer. You know, we work with <clears throat> over fifteen thousand different suppliers. And we try to offer resources ourselves, you know, things that we can do to help, um, you know, these companies uh, become more effective. So, you know, all, all those things, I think, taken together are really helping to create a lot of resources to help. Uh, but there's probably still more that we can do there. Um, and then, you know, finally, you know, it, it's really about incentivizing, you know, how do we, I don't like saying enforce, because I feel like we started from a place of enforcement, and I don't know that was as, as effective. You know, how do you incentivize these companies? So if they are resource constrained, what can make it easier, you know, for them to implement it from a cost perspective? So some of the um, some of the things that, that that industries are doing, and honestly, we're looking at this in automotive currently, is how do we kind of pool resources as the you know OEMs together? How do we commonize on those priority set of requirements, and then make it easy for a company to certify where they can sell to any company and and be achieving some level of security that's that's been certified. And, you know, I think that's that creates a, an environment where 
they only have to do something once it's cheaper it's more effective and then you know we're not all wasting kind of all of our time doing the same thing over and over again so i think there's there's something there and there's there's you know some some great case studies that talk about that um you know bringing the business along i think is another very important aspect because you know this started really from a security team perspective trying to provide requirements but more and more more often it's it's a two-way dialogue between us as the security team the business and the third party because the business is the one that's in the primary liaison seat with those companies and they understand what they're providing for the company they understand how to interact with them and so you know we're there to help but you know making sure that everyone understands that you know this could affect uh, any part of the business at any day um, and then, you know, finally, I know it's a long list, I'm sorry, but the, the final thing that we talked about was um, actually providing services ourselves out of the companies. You know, some companies have a position to do that. Um, again, I think all of these depend on like what kind of industry you're in, what kind of company uh, you are, what size and resources you have, what your relationship with your, your suppliers is like. Um, but that's another scenario that could help where maybe your industry is underserved by security services providers and you see a, a role that you can you can play. Um, so there's been you know several you know sort of case studies along those lines. So I don't think those are exhaustive, but I think it's a great list of here's the next steps. Um, some things work better in other industries. There's there's probably a lot of people. And we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, you know they're probably doing pieces of them, and you know maybe not everything, but but a lot of different aspects of, of all the seven different areas. But uh, I you know again taken together, I mean, this is representing what the, I think a lot of leading companies across all industries are thinking about and, and, and trying to execute when it comes to third-party security. So I think it's kind of state-of-the-art. I think it's it's where the, the boundary condition is. And, you know, we're still learning. Every day is, is still a learning um, activity. Thank you very much, Kevin. And, you know, what resonates from what you shared is that, you know, it's 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 a living document, right? It didn't start with, you know, several points and then, you know, it's only carved in stone and you don't learn. You learn as you go because the, the market conditions are uh, continuously changing. And I think you gave a great segue with uh, sharing that, uh, for instance, resilience is a very big thing because it's not if the cyber attack will happen, it's really when. And then the key thing is how we react on it uh, in that sense. And also you mentioned people and, you know, raising the awareness and then uh, building a muscle in that sense. And then you mentioned certification. And that brings me to you, Karen, and to the experience of Cyber Readiness Institute and basically your view of what are the best tools and actions for small and medium-sized enterprises to build up the muscle Kevin has shared. Well, and, and it was great. Again, like I said, I always love listening to Kevin speak. And so, um, and, and I hit on a couple of things where he talked about resilience. So I really like to start there and kind of build backward, right? And when you look at the foundational types of activities, you have to have a good solid foundation in order to build upon several of these other alternatives that, that are mentioned within the ESAP report. And that's really what the Cyber Readiness Institute is focused on for small and mid-sized businesses. It's, it's building a strong foundation. So we're not focused on the technology because we know they use technology. You can't go into a small business that's not using Apple Pay or Google Pay or you know the little iPad to do the receipts and send you stuff. Like they're all using technology, but they may not necessarily realize the risks associated with that. Or they don't really, and I think this is one good thing that came out of COVID is, is that small and medium businesses really got to understand how the supply chain worked, where their weaknesses were, what they needed to do in order to be able to stay into business and who, who was up and down that chain that they had to interact with. Again, using technology, they were using technology. So CRI focuses on four foundational activities, not on technology. And, and it's focused. And when you hear them, you're going to be like, yeah, okay, that's a no brainer because it's, you know, passwords, multi-factor authentication, automatic updates, phishing, and uh, removable media, which deals with storage. And phishing is the human behavior. And really what we're very focused on is building a culture of cyber readiness. So as they continue to grow, and they have more and more partners and they participate in more and more of the global supply chain, they're gonna be cognizant of the risk. They're gonna be 
thinking about all the questions that Kevin brought up, all of where those interactions are, how do I become resilient? One of the key things that we put in the program uh, with our new release that came out in March was the business continuity plan. So the, it's not just the incident response plan, but it's a business continuity plan. And it's based on an ISO standard, but we don't tell them, hey, here's the ISO standard number. Here, here's all the set. It has a worksheet that makes them ask key questions about how how would you do accounts payable? How would you do accounts receivable if you lost the power, if you lost this? It, it asks a series of questions where you're like, oh, you know, I really do need to plan on this. And then there's a prioritization work work plan. So then what we do is we also give them policies. We tell them they have to train their people. And we even break out all our videos so that they can use our videos to then train in these four core areas. So when they're done and we walk through the playbook with them, we verify the playbook, they do get uh, what we call a certificate of being certified cyber ready. They can go through our program now on the website and just complete it and still have all of this. But if you, and this is the part, Kevin, that I think links into what you're talking about is we are working um, jointly right now with, for example, the Cyberspace Solarium 2.0 group um, about the foundation, about the certificate that's uh, CRI issues, right? That a company would earn. And is that foundational product? Is that foundational playbook with those artifacts? Can that then be recognized as that foundation that you build upon when you then go into a different vertical and then you just need to do the delta, you know, and do the change and something that is specific. So we are running a pilot right now in water utilities, specifically focused on small and medium water utilities because they're under uh, the, they don't have to do a risk assessment as required by the government, but they are critical in their geographical area to major companies, to defense bases, to local communities. And so it's focused on water and waste. And so we're gonna study that, we're gonna implement it, we're gonna do up to 200 utilities, gather the data, and then really analyze like, hey, does that really improve to your point, Kevin, reduce the risk for everybody upstream and then downstream, and then be able to then show those artifacts to all their uh, partners. So actually, thank you, Karen, for sharing. You know, you hold the hand of those companies who are willing to embark on the journey to satisfy the cyber readiness for the large enterprises. And I think that also brings me to the next question, Kevin, which will be directly for you. And, uh, it can help our followers also to understand and see how a successful large enterprise like General Motors is addressing the findings in the report and uh, what changes are you instituting? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I foreshadowed it a little bit in my, my last response. You know, we're doing um, a little bit of, of everything to some degree and, and we're looking at, 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 at all options, of course. Um, but let me, I'll talk a little bit of specifically kind of where we are in that journey and, you know, what things will probably fit better in the automotive industry versus maybe a, a different sort of setup. Um, the thing that we started off with was prioritizing our requirements. So we, we've been on a, a journey, I think we're on the third or fourth version of our um, third party security information requirements, information security requirements. Um, and, you know, every one of those iterations has been about clarifying, simplifying, prioritizing and making sure that if we're if we're giving requirements to a supplier, they're appropriate. Um, I, again, I don't want to send 10,000 pages. I want to send just what you need as, as a supplier. And we go through a, a pretty rigorous process of understanding the risk of each one of those third parties. You know, are they handling sensitive or private information? Are they creating software for us? Are they part of our safety program? You know, there, there's many different things that we look at. And based on what they're doing for the company and what they're uh, kind of risk level to the company is, they'll get kind of a, a customized, prioritized set of requirements. Um, we've also been going deep with, you know, especially our critical value suppliers, which are kind of the highest tier, um, you know, of, of having more bi-directional conversation, more auditing, more, you know, more conversation around um, those core security controls that we kind of keep going back to. And I think that's been improving, but I think it's only one piece of it, right? That's only kind of so far. 
Um, resiliency is something, of course, it's a very broad effort across the entire company to ensure we have resiliency um, across our supply chain. And so we have been you know, bringing cybersecurity into that conversation, understanding, you know, do we have single source components, single source services, are things in geographic locations that are risky? Um, you know, how dependent someone are, are we on on an organization? If, if they go down, you know, what's our backup plan? There's a whole host of things that, that we kind of consider. And I think it's really good that we're doing that. But again, that's another thing. I don't think you can ever be 100% resilient. There's no company in the world can just depend on, you know, have multiple sources for everything and everything's always perfect. So I think it's another area where it's eating away at the pie, but it's not, you know, it's not going to get us 100% there. But it is a mindset. It's a culture shift of, hey, you know, here's the sort of things that we need to be ready for. And honestly, I think we've had a lot of it built in for, for many years. When we do have cyber events in our supply chain, um, I often, you know, I always hear from the team, yep, the team's on manual operating procedures. They're still able to process material. They're still shipping things, uh, but they're running their maybe more, you know, less efficient process or they're having to do things by hand or whatever. Um, but in every one of those circumstances, we've been able to, to, to circumvent the issue. We've been able to mitigate the issue for, for enough time to allow the the um, the company to, to bring itself back up and you know get back on its feet. And we, we've we lost very few units of production as it relates to a cyber event. So we've got it built in, but again, you know, as, as attacks get worse and companies, you know, maybe aren't following along fast enough, you know, I, I still have a lot of fear of, of kind of the worst case scenario there. Um, and then I, I mentioned just briefly uh, about what we're trying to do as an industry, which is I look at as incentivization, which is how do we commonize requirements? How do we get, um, you know, simplified and, and really get prioritized on what are the core things that company every company needs to do? And I think if they do it really well, it reduces all of our risks together. And at the same time, we get efficiency and we save money for for everyone because they're not they're not responding to me and Ford and Stellantis and Toyota. You know, we can maybe get to some sort of common set of requirements that really helps raise the raise the bar as well as, as reduce the cost. And I think the more that we can get to the win win situations, that's when, you know, we're going to really see progress being made, uh, because until we get there, until until the incentive model is, is kind of flipped, I think Karen you know, said it right. These are resource constrained companies and they're going to they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle with trying to set those priorities and they may just say, hey, this is something that's below the line. And. We'll deal with it when we deal with it. And that's not what we want to hear. But so I, I think the model, you know, has to evolve. So that's a little bit of what we're doing. Um, you know, we're continuing to, to try all those different things and listen to others, learn from others and, you know, measure our own program and see, hey, is this is this having the effect? It can kind of take a little bit of time for these things to pull through and really see the the measurable results. But um, I'm hopeful. I, I, I mean, I think we we have to be doing something different. We're doing that. We're, we're learning. And I think uh, I think it'll have an effect. Thank you very much, Kevin. You know, I'll, I'll uh, jump into your camp on completely being uh, hopeful after seeing what you are doing as a true partner to the whole ecosystem GM, GM is operating with. And I think this can be a, a leading example of how partnership, you know, structures the way towards the cyber readiness for everyone in the value chain. So usually we we close uh, the the conversations we have with an input from you know our uh, speakers in a sense of a message uh, you want businesses and supply chain leaders to take and this time I would like what you would like them to take from the report we have been talking about. So if you can do it in a sentence, both Kevin and then Karen, we can round up the conversation. Yeah, it's hard to do in a sentence, but I, I guess, you know, what, what I would summarize is uh, whether you sit in a business or you're in the supply chain, um, cyber's got to be a part of, of what you're looking at. You have to understand its implications on your business. And, you know, again, how do we get to the partnership? How do we get the incentive model right? So we're always looking for feedback. A part of our program has always been, hey, what, how can we make this easier on you? You know, we, we go and have those conversations. And so I think that two-way dialogue um, and just realizing that cyber has to be a part of the risk model, you know, moving forward. I think if people understand that, you know, we'll we'll make a lot of progress. Thank you very much, Kevin. Karen. Well, I I think um, the insights in the report. If I was a mid-sized company out there reading the report, it would give me uh, hope to realize I'm not in it alone. 
that these large companies have the same issues that I do as a medium company and that there's a lot of insight into how I can tackle this. And there's a lot of partners that are willing to help me. So that I that to me, again, I'm in the camp of let's work together and be hopeful and raise the bar. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. And thank you very much, Karen. Uh, this rounds up our discussion on uh, cyber readiness and cybersecurity within supply chains. Uh, we will close with a sentence which I really uh, like, like, Karen. You know, you are not alone with companies as General Motors is who can be a partner and the organizations like Cyber Readiness Institute are who can be the partner as well in your cyber readiness journey. So you have listened to another DSEI Insights in Action and we look forward welcoming you again soon.